Welcome to Worship with Messiah Online. We're glad you're with us today. Before we begin worship, I just want to start by saying Happy Mother's Day. And Mother's Day is not just a day for our physical mothers. It's a day to honor every woman who's been important in our lives. So, if you've ever been important in someone's life, thank you for making that contribution to the world. A couple other announcements. Relay for Life is coming up on May 18. You can still give to that online. Our movie group will meet May 19 at 4 p.m. Cornerstones is coming up on May 19 also. That's at 11.15. That's an opportunity to learn more about Messiah. You can sign up for that online. And Vacation Bible School is coming starting July 15. Now, we still need some folks to sign up to help us with that. Um, you can do that online. And take that opportunity to get to serve the next generation as they learn about Jesus. Now let's begin worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Let's pray. God of wisdom, love, and righteousness, you encourage us to center our lives on Christ Jesus and his love for us, living out Jesus' love for the world with humility, patience, and love. Help us to love others without judgment, to examine ourselves in light of Jesus' teachings, and to love and accept others with the love of Christ. And we pray in Jesus' mighty name, amen. Come down to the lake shore, seeking neither the wise nor the wealthy, but only asking for me to follow. Sweet Lord, you have looked into my eyes, kindly smile. And I have abandoned my small boat. Now with you, I will seek other seas. Tu has venido a la orilla, no has buscado ni a sabios ni a ricos. Tan solo quieres que yo te siga, Señor, me has mirado a los ojos, sonriendo has dicho mi nombre, en la arena he dejado mi voz. Buscaré otro mar. Sweet Lord, you have looked into my eyes, kindly smiling, you've called out my name. On the sand I have abandoned my small boat, now with you. Seek other seas. Our scripture passage today is from Matthew chapter 7, beginning at the first verse. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. This is the good news of the Lord. We continue our Gospel Rock Sermon Series today with the great 1972 hit by Johnny Nash, I Can See Clearly Now. This is a song that tells of a person beginning to see clearly the problems that they're facing while also looking towards the future. Early in Nash's career, he collaborated with the phenomenal and inspirational reggae artist Bob Marley. Nash took notable inspiration from Marley, and you can feel and hear the reggae influence in the song I Can See Clearly Now. This song gained popularity rapidly. It vaulted from number tw the tw number 20 spot to number one on the Billboard Hot 100 in 1972, where it stayed in that position for four weeks. The popularity of the sp song spread to other countries like Ireland, Canada, and South Africa. Over the years, there were a lot of cover versions of the song, but probably the most memorable was sung by Jimmy Cliff and was featured on the soundtrack of the very fun uh, sports comedy movie, Cool Runnings, back in 1993. 
The song hit the Billboard 100 charts again 21 years after its first release, rising all the way to number 18. The lyrics of the song and the gentle melody provide both optimism and comfort as they guide the listener's heart and soul through a shift of perspective that makes problems clear and brings hope for the future. It's an inspirational song of hope and courage for people facing adversity, but it points us towards a path forward from the dark clouds to the sunshine of better days ahead. Here's some of the lyrics. I could see clearly now the rain is gone. I could see all obstacles in my way. Gone are the dark clouds that had me blind. It's going to be a bright, bright, sunshiny day. William Sloan Coffin, pastor of the Yale University Chapel in the 60s and 70s and a famous peace activist, affirmed how important it is for us to see clearly who we are and who others are. There's so many dark clouds that blind us and make it so easy to forget our value and our purpose as well as the value and purpose of others. Coffin once said, God's love doesn't seek value, it creates value. It is not because we have value that we are loved, but because we are loved that we have value. Our value is a gift, not an achievement. The grace is in the sunshine that breaks through the dark clouds of self-doubt and greed, arrogance, self-pity, judgmentalism. Grace is the embrace that tells us someone knows us and sees us and loves us and is willing to open their arms wide no matter what. Grace is the embrace that does not waver or diminish when the clouds of life are blocking us from remembering who we are and why we're here. It is grace that begins to clear the skies. Grace doesn't depend on our response, our performance, our attitude, our faith, or our checkered past. Grace is the breeze that blows the clouds of shame, of low self-esteem, of not seeing or believing in our God-given purpose. It is grace that blows those dark clouds away. Grace just is. Why? Because grace heals. Not by taking shame away, but by removing the one thing our shame makes us fear the most, rejection. When we feel rejection, we feel we're not worthy. And then we begin to believe the lies that exist in the dark clouds and the shadows of life. So much of the time, our forgetting who we are and whose we are leads us away from the mirror of self-reflection into the dark clouds of shame and rejection. On some Sundays, we share in a confession of sin. And we declare an absolution, the forgiveness of sin. And when we do this, we're taking time for self-reflection. A time to focus, not just on our broken spaces, our mistakes, our screw-ups, but also, and more importantly, confessions remind, confession reminds us of the presence of God and of each other about our true self, the person that God created us to be, the person that God said to when he created us, this is good, you are good, you're very good. Reminded that we not, are not only forgiven, but we are created and we are sustained in and by love and by grace. And when we get in touch with our soul and we remember the person God created us to be, we don't need to go around putting others down to lift ourselves up. How often do we put someone else down to make them less in our eyes simply so that we feel that we're more? It's not life-giving to the other person or to us. It gives us a false sense of self. It's the very thing that Jesus talks about in the gospel reading today. Jesus gives us a formula for clarity, a call for humility, and a reminder of the damage that is done when we're not mindful of our own faults and shortcomings. How often do we look at others through a magnifying glass? Focusing on their, weak ups, their weakness, their mess-ups, their failures. All so that we don't have to look at ourselves. In this Bible verse today, Jesus gives us some pretty humorous yet convicting language when he speaks about the speck of dust in our neighbor's eye when we have a telephone pole lodged in our own eye. Jesus is giving us a way to have clarity in our lives. It explains that there's something in my eye that stops me from seeing clearly. 
In Matthew 7, 1 through 5, after telling us not to be judgmental, Jesus gives the humorous word picture about basically that telephone pole, that giant log or beam in our own eye. Jesus is telling us to do away with the judgment, the critical, fault-finding attitude towards the people around us. It's the what's wrong with you outlook. It's a painful outlook that rejects others rather than accepts them and invites them into the love and grace that God wants us to share with each other. And these words from Jesus are part of the Sermon on the Mount, according to the great theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who says it's possible to understand the Sermon on the Mount in a thousand different ways. But Jesus knows only one possibility, simple surrender and obedience. Not interpreting or implying it, but doing and obeying it. That is the only way to hear his words. He doesn't mean for us to discuss this as an ideal, He really means for us to get with it. Jesus is saying, Bobby Mooney, get with it. He's telling you, get with it too. If we want to see clearly, we need to simply get our eyes off the faults of others around us and focus on ourselves and and realize that we have shortcomings. We need to put our magnifying glasses away and stop trying to find the tiny little dust particle in another person's eye. And focus on getting that beam, the giant log, out of our own. So how do we actually get with it? How do we get with the words of Jesus and the lyrics to this song? They're both powerful reminders to be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to anger. Let us remember that we're all on a journey of faith. And if we're honest with ourselves, we're all wrestling with questions of doubt and uncertainties. There is no shame in that. It is just the honest truth. We cannot move forward into this grace if we're not honest with ourselves. This verse drives home the point of how crucial it is for us to extend to one another the same measure of grace and mercy that we ourselves hope to receive and that we ourselves have actually received. As we navigate the complexities of faith and doubt and community, let's strive to embrace more fully Jesus' words of wisdom Jesus is flat out telling us, don't judge others. Instead, he invites us into relationship with each other. Relationships that are filled with grace and compassion and understanding. It is living in the reality that each of us is an unfinished symphony, and we need to keep playing together to create the most beautiful music of love and unity among us. It's so easy to forget that each and every one of us was created to be part of this symphony. To forget that each of us was created for the purpose of joy sucks life from us. You are here on earth to bring joy. You are here in my life and in the life of others to bring joy. You are here for the very pleasure of God and your very being brings joy to God. Our hearts, our minds can get so busy We fill them up with so many things like worry, like greed, like shame and anger or hatred that our feet get all tangled up and we forget. We forget why we're here. We forget about the power of faith and the power of love and the power of grace. Think about this question. Why are you here? I mean, really and truly, why are you here on earth in this specific moment of time? Do you know? Archbishop Desmond Tutu reminds us to see clearly who we are and why we're here. When he quoted the 13th century Persian poet, Haviz, he says, I sometimes forget that I was created for joy. My mind is too busy. My heart is too heavy for me to remember that I've been called to dance, the sacred dance of life. I was created to smile, to love, to be lifted up and lift up others. Oh, sacred one, untangle my feet from all that ensnares. Free my soul that we might dance and that our dancing might be contagious. Yeah, you know it. Every single one of us, we're just supposed to be dancing machines, spreading joy. In my own journey as a pastor, as a husband, a dad, a brother, a friend, I forget. 
I often forget to dance. And I'm confronted with the temptation to judge others based on their looks, their attitudes, their station in life, their beliefs, their actions, their identities. And as we wrestle with and come to grips with what it means to be a follower and a lover of Jesus, we realize that faith is not about condemning or excluding others from the table or from our life. It is not about exclusion, but it is about radical love, radical inclusion, and radical hospitality. It's all about this really big table where we're all invited. And this is not about being religious or making everyone have some perfect theology or doctrine. It's about being lovers of Jesus and lovers of others. William Sloan Coffin once said, too many religious people make faith their aim. They think the greatest of these is faith. And faith defined as all but infallible doctrine. These are the dogmatic, divisive Christians more concerned with freezing the doctrine than warming the heart. If faith can be exclusive, love can only be inclusive. There is too much divisiveness out in our world today. And I would say that there are too many Christians out there saying that if you want to be, in the par- in, wanted to be invited into the party, you have to be like us. And that implies that we, me, must have it all perfectly figured out. That's not what Jesus is telling us here. As followers of Christ, we're called to embody the the love and compassion of Jesus in all that we do. Jesus is very clear that you and I don't have to have it all figured out perfectly. We don't have to understand it perfectly. And everyone doesn't have to be or think just like us how they see and experience the world or life in order for us to stand with them and to love on them. Jesus is clear that a big part of our purpose is to stand with the marginalized, to advocate for justice, to extend grace to those who need it most. And this often means to give this all to people who are very unlike us. This means listening to the stories of others, walking alongside them in their struggles, and resisting the urge to condemn or judge or exclude them. Jesus in Matthew 7 challenges us, invites us to be agents of love and grace in a world that is all too quick to judge and condemn. Jesus invites us to examine our own blind spots, to confront our own biases and prejudices before we dare to pass judgment on someone else. Both the song I can see clearly now in Jesus' words in Matthew Invite us into a deeper awareness of ourselves and relationship with those around us. They challenge us to cultivate humility, empathy, love, and understanding in all our interactions with people. Recognizing that we're all imperfect beings, deserving of grace and compassion. And this is the beginning point of our own transformation into being more like Christ. This transformation begins with a willingness to see clearly and love deeply. Jesus reminds us that the standard by which we judge others will ultimately be applied to us as well. That's a call to humility and self-reflection. And it's at the very heart of living out the radical love of Christ in relationship with those around us. In a world that so often values quick judgments and divisiveness, we're called to be peacemakers, bridge builders, agents of love. We're called to sow seeds of understanding and empathy, recognizing the humanity and the dignity in each person that we encounter. Author Sarah Bessie, a Canadian Christian author, writes in her book Field Notes for the Wilderness about how we remember who we are as loved children of God. And in remembering that our true self has a God-given purpose, and that as we discover that purpose, we also discover how we learn to love the world again. Perhaps part of what our problem today is, is that we've forgotten how to love the world. Not just each other in the broad and general sense, but to actually love the world that God created. To love the world itself. To love the physical earth that we inhabit. The ground that we stand on. The homes we build to rest and reside in. Yes, and to love even the very people that are in our midst. In Paul's letter to the Ephesian, he writes, Watch what God does, and then you do it like children who learn proper behavior from their parents. Mostly what God does is love you. Keep company with him and learn a life of love. 
Observe how Christ loved us. His love was not cautious, but extravagant. He didn't love in order to get something from us, but to give everything of himself to us. Love like that. So take a breath. Take a pause. Stop wasting energy judging others and remember where you came from. Remember whose image you're created in. And then simply be still and watch. Watch what God does. Bessie puts it this way. And here's what I do know about what God does. God so loves the world. God loves the world. Every blade of grass, every grunt and squeal of creatures, every kid who goes to sleep worried about something, every burning bush, every lullaby that we sing, all of it, all of us, held in that extravagant sacrificial love. Mostly, God, what God does is love you. Keep company with God and learn a life of love. Learn what a gift it is to be here, alive in your life. Then call to learn to love. The call to learn to love the world again is a call to engage with all of those big things, of course. Love never makes us smaller or narrower or lonelier. It never shuts us off or, or, or pushes away. Love is always about the longing and the hunger within us. But I wonder what it would be like to love the world again so much that we're unable to ignore things like climate change because the world is crying out for us to love her again. What would it be like to love the world so much that we believe women and protect children? What would it be like to love the world so much that we see the image of God in one another across the aisles, across the streets, and political divides and borders and the ones who've been, we've been taught to fear and resent? What would it look like to remember how to love the world again, even knowing it will break your heart? Loving is a worthwhile risk, a shot in the dark that illuminates everything, a radical act of faith and hope. Even in this, we're invited to be in step with the God who consents to having his heart broken and yet runs extravagantly into this world. For God so loved the world. For God so loved the world. For God so loved the world. People love to quote John 3.16. I do too. But have also become partial for the next verse. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. For God so loved this broken, longing, beautiful, terrified, burning, glorious, spinning world. We've been brought here for love, by love, for love, in love. Maybe God is desperate for us to love too. So we don't just love in some generic way, but we love specifically. We love in particular. Remembering how to love the world while still in the midst of our own evolution and transformation, it's complicated. But what would it look like to love the world, not in general, but in particular? Pay attention. Be mindful of loving this particular world and your particular people and your particular place and your particular self. Love is not cautious, but extravagant and specific. Bessie says, and so I've landed here right now, remembering to love this in particular. Love the pencil, crayons, and markers always on the kitchen table. Love the curl of steam from the tea in the morning. Love the light in the late afternoon illuminating the crumbs on the floor as holy. Love underlined poems and the sight of birds on the wind. Love the noise of the streets and the bass line in that one song. You know it. Love the donate button on a food bank website and the satisfying click of finding some small way to keep loving your neighbors. Love your body, every curve and change. Love the sounds of the words, I love you, I forgive you, I'm sorry, I miss you, I choose you. I made coffee and it's ready. Love the bark of the big old tree you watch through every season of change. Love this moment of particular grace, not in spite of all the grief and loss surrounding us, but because of it. Love this because now you know that Frederick Beekner was right. This is the world. Beautiful and terrible things will happen. Don't be afraid. Beautiful things are happening and terrible things are happening. Both are true. Don't be afraid. And you remember to find something in particular. Something in particular to love even during this wandering season. You can see clearly now. The rain is gone. 
And it's going to be a bright, bright, sunshiny day. There's so much to love out there and right here. So let's all love. Love something. Love someone in particular today. Amen. And now let's join together in confessing our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Thanks, Pastor Bob. The Caring Hands Food Pantry needs some food. As you can see from these pictures, their shelves are nearly bare. Supplies are low, and donations are slow right now. Lots of donations come in at holidays and at Super Bowl time, but people get hungry and food is distributed every week of the year at the pantry. You can bring your donations on Sundays or on the first Monday of the month at our drive through and our next drop-off will be June 3. As we come to our offering time, in Exodus 35, beginning at verse 4, we read, Moses said to all the congregation of the people of Israel, This is the thing that the Lord has commanded. Take from among you a contribution to the Lord. Whoever is of a generous heart, let him bring the Lord's contribution. God calls us to give generously out of what God has first given us. Because everything is really God's, and we are caretakers of what God has provided for us. Through your gifts and offerings, many people are cared for, nurtured, and fed physically and spiritually, both at and through Messiah and the other ministries we support. And our faith is strengthened as we give. Thank you for all the ways that you support Messiah and the many ministries that we are involved in, including the Caring Hands Food Pantry. May we continue to share the love of Christ through our generosity, our compassion, our grace, and our service to others. As always, there are various ways to live, including using your online giving, using the app on our, on our site, uh, or writing a check. Believe it or not, we still take checks. Thank you for all of your support and all you do to help us love God and love one another. Now let's pray. O oh Lord, our God, maker of all things, through your goodness you have blessed us with abundance beyond measure. With our offerings, we give ourselves to you for your service and dedicate our lives to the care and redemption of all people and of all of creation you have made. Draw our hearts to you, guide our minds, fill our imaginations, and control our wills so that we may be wholly yours. Use us as you will, always to your glory and the welfare of your people. By the death and the resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, you turn us from the old life of bondage, sin, and failure. Grant that we who are reborn to new life in Christ may live in freedom, holiness, humility, and righteousness all of our days, living out your love for the world and our neighbors. We pray in the name of Jesus, who gave his life and rose so that we may be reconciled to you and all people. Amen. And now, gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let's join in the prayer our Lord taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now let's sing our sending song.
Thank you once again for joining us today. To all the women out there, we are so thankful for all the gifts that you share with us, the tenderness, the compassion, the love, um, for pouring into each of our lives. And to all the moms, happy Mother's Day. And now, receive the benediction. May God go before you to show you the way, above you to watch over you, beneath you to support you, beside you to be your best friend, and within you to fill with peace, love, and uncontainable joy. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace, and let us serve our Lord with joy, and remember, you are a dancing machine. Go in peace. Thanks be to God. <laughs>